Okay, for today's notes, we'll be looking at section 9.5, really dealing with the concepts of hybridization. Now, if you recall where we were talking yesterday, dealing with atomic overlapping orbitals. When S's and P's from two different atoms, electrons in those orbitals, come together, the orbitals can overlap and the old atomic orbitals become new molecular orbitals. And yesterday we were looking at how S's and P's can do that to form sigma and pi bonds. Now, one of the issues or problems that scientists had with this is, is something that you can see with a relatively simple molecule. Now, bonds between atoms are formed then by electron pairs in overlapping atomic orbitals. Now, a simple example of this would be the case of diatomic hydrogen. You've got 1s orbitals in each case. Those are involved in your bonding. So our two 1s electrons from each come together, and they end up sharing in an overlapping orbital yesterday we called a sigma bond. So they used to be located around this region. And when they come together, they move to this new region in between. So it works fairly simple with the case of diatomic hydrogen. Now, when you look at something like water, however, we encountered a problem with this particular model. Now, if you take a look at water, on the valence level for water, we've got our 2s that's full. And then we have on our 2p sublevel, uh, two electrons in the first orbital, one electron in each of the other orbitals, which, which looks good. You've got two free electrons available for bonding. The hydrogens come in with their uh, 1s electrons. So at the beginning, everything looks good. So you can use your 2p orbitals for bonding with the 1s's. And that would basically imply that what's going to happen is your p's, which remember you've got the px, py, and pz axis. So let's say this is our py and this is our px, the distance between those two, or I should say the bond angle between those two px's, would be 90 degrees. Well, if what you get is an overlap of the p with the s's, you would end up with orbitals uh, in the molecule that are 90 degrees <coughs> Excuse me, from each other. And we know from water molecules that we talked about uh, a couple of days ago, um, the bonding in this should really be a tetrahedral pulsion, which is around 109.5 degrees. But the unshared pairs that are involved actually push it, pushes it slightly lower than that, but nowhere near 90 degrees. So from Vesper theory, we really should end up with around a 104.5 degree angle. And this would imply a 90 degree angle. So our current model of atomic overlapping orbitals doesn't work even for something as simple as water. So really, what's happening? Well, what's happening is what we call hybrid orbitals. That's really what we're getting to in section 9.5. If overlapping orbitals don't always seem to work, then how do we really explain the geometries that we do perceive? And what we're looking at is what's known as valence bond theory. And hybrid orbitals are a part of va valence bond theory. Now, hybridization is really a blending of orbitals. And valence bond theory is really based upon two fundamental assumptions. The strength of the covalent bond is proportional to the amount of overlap between the atomic orbitals. The greater the overlap, the more stable the bond is going to be. So that's one fundamental idea of uh, valence bond theory is the more overlap you get between your two atoms coming together, the stronger the overall and more stable the overall bond is going to be. And question number 42 from the homework in this chapter is going to be related to that idea. Now, second fundamental assumption of valence bond theory is that an atom can use different combinations of atomic orbitals to maximize the overlap. Remember, the more overlap, the more stable. So it's going to use a combination of different orbitals to maximize the overlap between the orbitals. And that's really what hybridization really is. Now, what we're going to end up using then in this chapter is hybridization to explain all the different molecular geometries that we see. Uh, when we have atoms coming together to form molecules. So all electron domains around the central atom must be hybrid orbitals. They can't be their old atomic orbitals. We must form new hybrid orbitals. And what's true is they're going to be equal in energy to each other or degenerate. So all of the bonds in this molecule in CCL4, every one of those bonds should be new hybrid orbitals that are equal in energy. And the same actually works for this. Here we have an unshared pair, and we have three shared pairs. 
uh, but these are actually all in different regions of space than they were in the atom. So all four of these must also be new hybrid orbitals that are degenerate equal in energy. So both of these had four electron domains. So both of these need to form four new hybrid sets of orbitals that are degenerate. Now where do they come from? Well, it really depends upon the situation. And you can see a little bit better what we're talking about here if we take a look at what was happening with methane, because methane was one of the first molecules that they were trying to explain. So you can see why they must be equal in energy if we really look at what's going on in methane. Now, the carbon ground state configuration looks like this. 1s with two electrons, 2s with the two electrons, and on the 2p sublevel, you only had two electrons. Well, can you see a problem with this type of uh, ground state configuration if we're trying to form CH4 methane? Now, as a hint, remember, look at how many unpaired electrons, because those are electrons that are going to be available for bonding. Well, the issue really is here, it appears we only have two electrons available for bonding, and we know that's not enough. CH4 has to form four bonds. So this cannot be how this structure remains if we're going to become a molecule. So how does a carbon overcome this problem? Well, the very first thing they looked at, so this is basically their first proposition for what's happening. So early chemists thought that what would happen is they would promote that 2s electron that used to be here up to here, and that would end up forming then four unshared pairs of electrons that would be available for bonding. So we used to have this situation, and what they proposed is if it promotes that 2s to the 2p, we now have four single electrons that can be available for bonding. Well, when you extend this idea and actually do the bonding, you can quickly see that there's a problem that's going to arise here. So this is what we're starting with, with our idea of how a hybrid orbital forms. Well, the basic idea here is these three bonds, the sharing of the 1s from the three hydrogens with the 2p electrons, from our carbon atom, those are all going to be basically equal to each other. But that fourth bond, the 2s sharing with the 1s, that bond is actually going to have slightly less energy than the other bonds in the methane molecule. So this particular bond right here is going to be different from these three bonds if this is the model of how this hybrid orbital forms. So that bond is going to be slightly different in character than the other three. And that difference would be measurable to chemists when you look at bond length and bond energy. So is this what we really observe with a methane molecule? Is that bond truly different? Well, simple answer is no. Measurements show that our flow bonds in the methane molecule are equal. They're equal in both distance and they're equal in energy. So that particular model of hybridization really failed to adequately explain what we knew was true with methane. So what chemists did was they proposed an explanation that's known as hybridization. And hybridization is really combining two or more orbitals of nearly equal energy. So that's important here. The 2s and the 2p were e close to each other in energy with the same atom in, uh, to form equal energy orbitals. That's really what hybridization is. Taking and blending relatively equal energy sublevels into new molecular orbitals of equal energy. Now, in the case of methane, the proposal really looks like this. Now, our original situation here is we have our two electrons in the 2s sublevel, and then we had two electrons in the 2p sublevel. Well, what they propose is when that electron gets promoted to there, what we form are four equal energy hybrid orbitals that are different from the original S and 2P situation. And you can see in terms of energy here, this particular hybrid set is slightly more in energy than the old 2S and slightly less in energy than the 2P. And the key is they're all equal in energy. So we're forming a completely new type of hybrid orbital from our blending of an S and 3Ps. And that's why I refer to it as SP3 hybridization. And what we get with sp3 hybridization is four electron domains of equal energy that will repel each other in our 109.5 degree geometry. So if the hybridization is occurring in this way, we get what we do expect to get, four equal bonds in a methane molecule. So really what you're doing is you're taking the old atomic orbitals 
and you're blending them into these four equal energy sp3 hybrid orbitals that together form the geometry that we know exists in a methane molecule 109.5 so that's really what hybridization is a blending of old atomic orbitals for new molecular orbitals now anytime you have four electron domains you're always going to have sp3 hybridization because we need four equal energy new hybrid orbitals so in the case of NH3, which is an unshared pair in three single bonds, you still have sp3 hybridization. You still see the roughly 109.5 degree tetrahedral repulsion in the case of ammonia. It's just that what happens is this unshared pair of electrons occupies a slightly greater region of space than the shared pairs, and that bends down the bond angle just a little bit to a little less than 109.5. In the case of water, we have the exact same situation. Water which has two unshared pairs and two single bonds, also needs to have four equal energy hybrid orbitals. So CH4, NH3, and H2O all have four electron domains. All are sp3 hybridization. Now, hybridization for other things, like some non-octets, expanded octets, how does it work with other types of things? Because when you get four, that's not hard to visualize. You've got S and you've got three Ps. Those can blend together in sp3 hybridization to form the hybrid orbitals that we need. But how about something like BEF2? BEF2 is an exception to the octet rule. It's stable with just two single bonds. So the hybridization here has to be a little bit different. We only need two equal energy orbitals in the case of beryllium difluoride. Now if you take a look at beryllium, its ground state electronic configuration looks like this. It basically has 1s and 2s orbitals filled and at that point you have no unshared pairs of electrons, you have no electrons available for bonding. But it's not too hard to see that if we promoted one of the 2s's to a 2p that would give us our two unshared pairs of electrons we would need to form bonds with the fluoride. Now the difference in this particular situation is we really only need and only have two orbitals. We don't really need these hybrid orbitals in this particular case. We've got no electrons in them. So mixing the S and P orbitals actually yield two degenerate orbitals that are hybrids of the two original orbitals. So we've got an overlap between an S and a P to form two hybrid SP orbitals. And when you put those two orbitals together, they're going to be two regions of space as far apart as they can push each other, is that linear 180 degrees repulsion we would expect to see in BEF2. So this is basically what happens in the case of beryllium difluoride, is you only need two degenerate molecular orbitals, so you have a blending of an S and a P for two SP hybrid orbitals. So these sp hybrid orbitals really look somewhat similar to what the p orbital did, but you can see on one side you've got a significantly greater volume of space than on the other side. So one lobe is a little bit larger than the other, and that's pretty much what all of our hybrid orbitals look like. So these two general orbitals will align 180 degrees apart from each other, and they would blend to form a BEF2 molecule. And that's consistent with what we observe. It should be a linear molecule. And that's what this type of hybridization, two equal energy hybrid orbitals, would end up forming a linear configuration. So what really happens here is we end up with a new hybrid set of SP orbitals, two of them. So 1S and 1P combined to make an SP hybrid set. And like I said, they have slightly more energy than the 1S, slightly less energy than the original 2P. Now, another exception that we talked about would be boron trifluoride. Now, boron needs three single bonds, and that's it. So we need three equal energy orbitals. So using a similar model to boron, we can see what's happening here is if you promote one of the 2S to a 2P, you end up with this situation. Now we've got our three electrons for bonding, but they have to be equal in energy, so they're going to hybridize in this way. 1s and 2ps, that would be sp2 hybridization. And when they blend together, we have 2ps and a s coming together to form our sp2 hybridization. So we've got three equal energy electron domains, and as far apart as they can get is the 120 degrees, which we would expect from a trigonal planar molecule like boron trifluoride.
Now, expanded octets. Similar type idea. We have to look at something slightly new, and it shouldn't be a surprise. We only have the one S, and we only have the three Ps. So if we need more than four bonds, we have to get electrons from somewhere else. And remember, it needs to be somewhat equal in energy or similar in energy. And what's closest in this particular case would be our 3D sublevel. So you end up in the case of five equal energy hybrid orbitals uh, when you have a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry. That would take one of our S's, three of our P's, and one of our D's to get four equal or to get five equal energy hybrid orbitals. And that's why I refer to this type of hybridization as SP3D. So basically, you're going to pull as many Ds as you need. So if we go to um, this type of uh, hybridization, you're going to promote that one electron, and that gives us a total of five sp3d orbitals, all equal in energy. A little bit lower than our 3s. Or I'm sorry, a little bit higher than our 3s and 3p were. A little bit lower than our 3d. And since we have five equal energies, that gives us the predicted geometry of our molecules of trigonal bipyramidal for something like PF5. Same principle really works if we go to an octahedral situation. So if we need five electron domains, it's SP3D. If we need six electron domains, like in the case of an octahedral repulsion, then we need one more D involved. So we end up with an SP3D2. So really what it comes down to is how many electron domains do you need? In the end, it's actually a fairly, fairly simple thing to determine. Hybridization, in the end, ends up one of the easiest things to do in the chapter. Really all you have to look at is how many hybrid orbitals we really need. If we need two, it's going to be the blending of an S and a P. If we need three, it's going to be the blending of an S and two Ps, so we would call it SP2 hybridization. If we have four electron domains, it's going to be SP3. Five is SP3D, and six would be SP3D2. So really, in the end, all you do is count your electron domains. That's it. Once you know what your electron domain is, that tells you what type of hybridization you have to have. So whether you're looking at BEF2 or HGCl2, both of these just have two electron domains. They're both going to be SP hybridization. BF3, SO3, doesn't matter. Both of these are going to end up with three electron domains. They're going to be SP2 hybridization. CH4, NH3, H2O, NH4+. Every single one of those, when you draw them, are going to have four electron domains. Every single one will be SP3 hybridization, and so on. All you have to do for hybridization is count your electron domains, and that's going to tell you exactly what type of hybridization you have. And that ends our notes for this evening over hybrid orbitals. In the end, remember, it's as simple as counting electron domains, and that's all you have to do. So it really is that easy.